Well, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, water off the southwest coast of Florida has risen more than seven inches since 1965. Uh, NOAA says, quote, warmer air resulting from climate change increased the amount of rain that Hurricane Ian dropped in Florida by at least 10 percent. Senior Republican politicians in, the Flo in Florida continue to oppose major climate legislation, like when Governor DeSantis blocked the state's pension fund from considering climate when making investment decisions. Joining us to discuss the dichotomy is author of Apocalypse Never, Michael Schellenberger. Welcome back. Thanks for having me, guys. So last time we were on the podcast, uh, sorry, I keep doing that. That's such a Freudian slip for a podcaster. I guess it is technically a podcast also. But last time you were on Rising, you uh, talked to us a little bit about this tension between um, whether it was appropriate to be having a conversation about climate change in the context of the most recent storm to cause devastation in, in Florida. Um, as, as a, you know, is it a part of a, a larger story about an increasing frequency or strength of hurricanes, um, or are, is the increasing um, destruction that comes from these uh, related to other factors like more building along coastlines, et cetera. When you read a lot, a lot, you know, of the climate resources that you see out there, they do point to a growing frequency and strength of hurricanes over the last, uh, since the 80s, 40, 50, uh, 40 years or so. What do you, what do you think about yes. this? Well, definitely there's been an increasing frequency of hurricanes since the 1970s and 80s, but the 1970s and 80s were two very were two very low decades. There appeared a period of very low hurricane frequency. And so if we're dealing with climate change, it's important to use the full data set, which goes back to the 19th century. We can see that from that period or from 1900 until today, there has been no increase in overall hur hurricane frequency, nor has there been an increase in major hurricanes. So when journalists, you know, cherry pick the period after 1980, it's very deceptive. Climate change is real. It's definitely being caused by humans, in my view. I think we should do something about it. I do think it's appropriate to talk about climate change in the context of hurricanes. We should also talk about climate change in the context of the global energy crisis that we're in and is going to be extremely serious and devastating for Europe. And my concern is that the alarmism sort of blots out the sun in terms of cons in terms of considering other things we need to worry about, including increasing oil and gas production in the United States. When we're so monomaniacally focused on a single issue like climate change, I think we can miss the fact that there's other things that are going on in the world that we also need to pay attention to and, and maybe be um, as or more alarmed about. I think that some people might push back and say, in fact, we spend a lot of time talking about things like the global oil supply. We've already done a segment or two about it today here on this show. And that climate change, despite its huge um, global implications, because it is a slower moving catastrophe, often doesn't get um, fully the, the attention that it deserves. Obviously, there was a award-winning movie this year by friend, you know, written by friend of the show, uh, uh, David Sirota, about how People just don't want to look up. People don't want to confront it head on. And some people argue that events like a hurricane cause people to focus in and grab people's attention in a way that, generally speaking, talking about rising global temperatures or rising sea levels don't always always grab people's focus. Do you think that that is a good faith reason to want to have the conversation about cl climate change now? Or do you think it still is missing the forest for the trees? Well, I definitely think it's always a good time to talk about climate change. I think it's um, I find it honestly bizarre to imagine that we haven't talked about climate change enough. We talk about climate change all the time. It's been one of the biggest issues over the last 30 years. You know, somewhere between a third to 50 percent of all human beings in the world think that climate change is going to make humankind extinct. That's not something that's in any United Nations intergovernmental panel on climate change report. That's not a mainstream view. There's no evidence for that. Climate change is real. It's not the end of the world. I think that the apocalyptic presentation of it is deeply uh, is counterproductive, uh, both in inspiring kind of broad based action. But look, I mean, Congress just passed a huge, you know, three hundred eighty billion dollar subsidy package for uh, for low carbon energy. So the idea that climate change is not a salient concern, I find that really bizarre. I don't think you need hurricanes I mean, to talk about it. We and if we are going to talk it. about it, I just think we should talk about it accurately. I, I, 
and I totally agree that we should talk about it accurately, but I think there's there's one thing for people to believe that climate change is real, which was a, a hard battle to, to win, right? But it's another thing to point out that it's not it's not the subject of news coverage. It's not the subject of news coverage here. It's not the subject of news coverage on other kinds of shows. And I take your point that it, it, it's not going to result in the life on Earth being over in a cataclysmic way. But for the millions of people who die, for the millions of people who are subject to a climate forced migration, um, for the millions of people who are going to be sickened by toxic air conditions. We saw a third of Pakistan underwater this past year. We have incredible air conditions in places like China and India, where visibility sometimes means that you can't see yards ahead of you. That happened back in the summer or the winter rather, I think it was of 2017, that horrible air conditioned moment that happened in, uh, in India. There's unaccounted for deaths as a consequence of these kinds of conditions. Entire island nations stand to go underwater. So it will definitely have an existential impact on millions and per perhaps even a billion people across the, the globe. That being the case, you know, can you talk about it too much? Well, I think it is important to get the numbers right. So I think and I think it's important not to conflate air pollution with climate change. There are two separate problems. Climate change is a result of the accumulation of greenhouse gases that trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, air pollution shortens the lives of six million people a year. You know, air pollution has significantly declined in developed economies, um, including up to 99% because we've done such a good job in moving towards cleaner burning and cleaner energy sources. You know, to put natural disaster deaths in context, somewhere between 300 and 500 people a year in the United States die from natural disasters. So that's a far cry from millions. It's also nowhere close to say the 100,000 people that die of drug overdoses, the, the 35,000 that die of car accidents, and in terms of you know migration, Syria, there's been a lot of exaggerated claims. The science does not support the claims that the Syrian war or the Syrian refugees were caused by climate change. I think what I worry about is that we miss the fact that rising human resilience has reduced deaths from natural disasters by over 95%, even as the global population has quadrupled. The result is that actually the sheer number of natural disasters, what counts as a natural disaster since it's measured strictly as deaths and disasters, has declined before, between 2000 and 2022. And the reason for that is just because so few so fewer people are dying from climate related disasters and the costs, once you factor in greater wealth and harm's way, the changes to Miami, for example, all the apartment buildings, we do not see a climate change signal there. So. Again, I think it's real, we should pay attention to it, but for me as an environmentalist, it's not even my top environmental concern. I, I, I'm I do much think it's more important to get like the numbers right. 1,500 people did just die in the floods in Pakistan. You know, like that, that, that is a reality. And I take your point about air pollution yeah. not being climate change, but it's also alluded to these, the fossil fuel emissions and what the, the, the source of a lot of that air pollution. It's not all cars, obviously, especially in those parts of the world, but this, these are related things. I'm sorry, Robbie, go ahead. But, uh, Michael, what kind of um, energy solutions are, are you looking to, you know, from the perspective of someone who wants to address climate change and, 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 and have a better, you know, environmental condition, but doesn't want to, you know, roll back technological progress that makes us more resilient, as you said, to things like climate change? What, you know, what's the path forward? What's the best path forward policy-wise? Sure. And let me just add, too, that floods uh, in Pakistan and the damage and deaths from floods in Pakistan are actually also declining. You have to remember, flood control can prevent floods. That's why we have these beautiful flood management systems. So we're not doomed because of greater precipitation to greater flooding. But Robbie, to your point, my view is that it's about the direction of travel. If you're using wood and dung as your primary energy, anything is better than that going from, from wood and dung to coal to hydro. For those of us in the developed world, the right, right direction of travel is the one that we've gone in, which is from coal to natural gas. That's reduced American carbon emissions by 22% between the year 2005 and 2020. It's the greatest reduction of carbon emissions in human history. And then from natural gas, we should move to nuclear energy. And ultimately, you get to a completely zero carbon economy when you have nuclear power. It's also providing hydrogen for future hydrogen vehicles. So my view towards these fuels is if you're using, people ask me, are you in favor of natural gas? I'm in favor of natural gas when it's replacing coal. I'm against natural gas if it's replacing nuclear. 
But, you know, we're in a worldwide energy crisis. Europe and Asia desperately need American oil and gas. We should be significantly increasing our oil and gas production to help our allies in Europe. And ultimately, that means a big nuclear building program, but also an expansion of liquefied natural gas terminals so that we can export more of this incredible natural gas bounty that we have in the U.S. Mm. Four million acres of farmland lost in Pakistan, 10 million children in need of immediate life-saving support. I'd be really interested to have an ongoing conversation about what kind of infrastructure could be built to keep a third of a country from being subject to those kinds of flooding, and also how to yeah. obviously lower the consumption and burning of the kind of fossil fuels that are driving some of these climate impacts. But we appreciate you being here with the limited time that we have today. Thank you so much, Michael. Good to be with you guys. More rising after this.